Hello everyone. The topic for today is imaging and subarachnoid hemorrhage. I am Dr. Sun Walker. I am a, a consultant in diagnostic and interventional neuroradiology at Royal Preston Hospital in UK. So we will look at detection of subarachnoid hemorrhage. We will look at the next investigation to be performed in patient with suspected SAH and confirmed SAH. We will look at some patterns of subarachnoid hemorrhage and differential diagnosis based on them and a few cases of pseudo subarachnoid hemorrhage. We will use a case based approach in looking at all these things. So let's look at case one. So this was a 50 year old female presenting in one of the peripheral hospitals with sudden onset acute headache and neck pain associated with photophobia. A typical clinical a history associated with subarachnoid bleed. A CT head scan was performed accordingly, which was done somewhere around the midnight. And the consultant radiologist who was looking at them missed the subarachnoid bleed within the anterior interhemispheric fissure and the prepontine cistern. In cases where you still have a strong suspicion of subarachnoid hemorrhage, a lumbar puncture is recommended, which was supposed to be performed the next day morning. However, patient presented with another episode of subarachnoid hemorrhage and this time the subarachnoid bleed extended into the parenchyma and the ventricle. There was sudden increase in pressure within the intracranial compartment and pressure patient didn't manage to reach the tertiary center. So this was a case of a missed subarachnoid hemorrhage. Missed subarachnoid hemorrhage is not uncommon. It is seen at presentation in about 12% of the cases and the most common cause being a failure to obtain a CT scan and misinterpretation of the CT or lumbar puncture results. It does have a profound impact on the outcome of the patient. A patient in whom the diagnosis is missed at presentation but picked up later. A poor outcome is seen in about 41% patients versus 18% otherwise. If it is missed completely, that is even not detected at a later stage, then the outcome is even worse, with 65% of the patients having a one year mortality. So, in detection of the subarachnoid hemorrhage, the most important modality is still a CT scan, which is quite sensitive if done within six hours of the ICTES. It is still sensitive till day five, but the sensitivity drops exponentially after that to about 50% at day 7 and 30% at day 14. What about lumbar puncture? Lumbar puncture in subarachnoid hemorrhage mainly focuses initially on detection of xanthochromia. Xanthochromia is this yellowish discoloration of the CSF which is seen on one of those test tubes. So this can be seen by naked eyes but can be better appreciated by spectrophotometry. So xanthochromia is due to the degradation of the blood and release of the bilirubin pigment which then stains the CSF. While taking the CSF for xanthochromia, while storing it for spectrophotometry, it has to be stored away from light because otherwise it can get degraded by exposure to light as well. Sensitivity of lumbar puncture is quite high, almost 100% for the first two weeks and even in the third week it is as high as 70%. What about MR? The flare and gradient echo sequence and the susceptibility weighted imaging have been reported to have high sensitivity in the acute, subacute, and chronic phase, but do not appear to be as sensitive during the hyperacute phases. There are some practical problems with patient cooperation for MR scans, and it is difficult to differentiate between meningitis as well as the increased CSF signal along the subarachnoid spaces seen following lumbar puncture. Just to see a few examples, this is the high signal within the superior sulcal gyrus on the left side on flare imaging and this is the low signal seen on the SWI sequence along the sulcal spaces. So these are the typical appearances on MR for the subarachnoid bleed. The main point for from the case number one is to make sure that you don't miss a diagnosis of subarachnoid bleed. So in any case with a suspected SAH, please look at these following review areas. So review areas like these, 
posterior part of the sylvian fissure, interpedicular cistern, base of the anterior interhemispheric fissure, prepontine cistern, superior sulcus, sulcus superior frontal sulcus, cervical medullary junction, and not last but not least, the fluid levels along the base of the occipital horns of the lateral ventricles. So look at these review areas before saying that there is no evidence of subarachnoid hemorrhage on the CT scan. Based on the patterns, we can reach a few differential diagnoses for the subarachnoid bleed and investigate them accordingly as well. So there are basically three main patterns. In pattern number one, the subarachnoid blood is primarily along the supracellar cisterns, sylvian fissures and interhemispheric fissures. These, this is the most common pattern seen with traumatic subarachnoid blood and circle of villus aneurysm rupture. The basal uh, perimesenkephalic peripontine perimedullary cistern is when the subarachnoid hemorrhage is within the posterior fossa. The most common cause is non aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage, although vertebrobacillar artery aneurysms and dissections involving the pica and the vertebral artery are quite common as well. The third pattern is when the bleeding or the subarachnoid blood is primarily restricted along the convexities of the brain. Here the causes of subarachnoid bleed are entirely different from the previous two patterns and the etiopathology is quite different. We will look at some cases to show the different patterns and investigations accordingly. So this is a case too of a 35 year old male who was found confused on the street on Saturday morning which is quite common. Headache, neck pain, a bit of bruising on the face as well. When the CT head was performed it showed some subarachnoid blood along the temporal convexity, possibly some blood within the parenchyma as well and bleed within the base of the anterior interhemal within the base of the frontal lobes bilaterally when some other uh, images were evaluated there was some contusion in the right parietal region as well and a parietal bone fracture so this was typically an example of a traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage now traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage can be because of either rupture of the cortical arteries or veins however the most common cause is extension of a hemorrhagic contusion rather than a parenchymal hematoma. Sometimes there can be bleed within the choroid plexus extending into ventricles. The volume of blood is usually quite small in these cases. The most common locations are the trigone of the lateral ventricle and the fourth ventricle. Very rarely traumatic subarachnoid can be secondary to a traumatic dissecting aneurysm. It is the most common cause of subarachnoid hemorrhage and the locations are quite typical as we saw in the images along the temporal convexity, base of the frontal lobes, sylvian fissures more along the lateral part of the sylvian fissure, intraventricular blood within the fourth ventricle or the trigone of the lateral ventricles and occasionally at the ambient cisterns as well where the tentorial edge causes bleed in the adjacent veins. There are always associated features of head trauma. If there is a typical history, associated features of head trauma, no further investigation is required. But if there is any doubt whatsoever, please get a CT and jaw. This last point is well illustrated in this companion case, which was for a 48-year-old male who was found collapsed on the street with some bruising on one side of the face. The CT head scan showed bleed along the medial margin of the temporal lobe and extending into the anterior interhemispheric fissure as well. The distribution of blood was not typical of a trauma, although this was what was suspected clinically. So a CT angiogram was done, which demonstrated the right MCA bifurcation aneurysm, which needed urgent treatment with coiling. So in cases where the distribution of the bleed is not very typical, keep a high clinical suspicion and a low threshold for performing a CT angiogram. In most of the cases of aneurysmal subarachnoid bleed, the distribution of the blood tells you about where 
to expect an intracranial aneurysm. Like in this CT study, there is blood predominantly within the anterior interhemispheric fissure. So the subarachnoid bleed is most likely due to an aneurysm in the anterior communicating artery shown on the CT angiogram and the 3D reconstruction of the DSA. Sometimes the blade is more diffuse and it's difficult to tell where exactly the underlying aneurysm can be. However, there can be some subtle signs like in this case, the blood within the right paracellar cistern is slightly more compared to the left side. When the CT angiogram was done, it showed an aneurysm involving the communicating segment of right ICA, the PCOM aneurysm, which was confirmed on the DSA and treated with balloon assisted coiling. Sometimes the subarachnoid blood also shows an associated extension into the adjacent parenchyma. So these are two different cases, one with subarachnoid bleed and parenchymal hematoma within the right temporal lobe and the lower image showing predominantly a parenchymal bleed within the left frontal lobe. Again, CT angiogram was done for both these cases. The top K images show a PCOM aneurysm which had actually ruptured and caused bleeding along the subarachnoid space and parenchymal hematoma as well. In the bottom set of images, it is more of an anterior, distal anterior cerebral artery aneurysm extending into the adjacent brain, giving rise to a parenchymal hematoma with intraventricular extension and subarachnoid bleed. Sometimes the pattern of subarachnoid bleed and the parenchymal hematoma appear slightly atypical, as in this case where there is some associated edema in the right temporal lobe, some shift of midline structures, possibly early hydrocephalus as well. CT angiogram was done and did not show any aneurysm involving the circle of Willis. However, prominent venous channels were seen along the floor of the anterior cranial fossa. When a DSA was performed, it demonstrated a dural AV fistula draining into the transverse sinus. So, a dural AV fistula can present with venous hypertension and bleed within the parenchyma extending into the subarachnoid space. The clinical presentation can mimic subarachnoid bleed and so can the non-contrast CT head appearance. Coming to the second pattern, which is bleed primarily within the posterior fossa, which is a basal perimesencephalic and peripontine perimedullary cistern hemorrhage. Let's look at few cases. So this was a 53-year-old female, again presenting with sudden onset severe headache, neck stiffness, photophobia. Now the CT head scan was done and sometimes we are lucky to get the final diagnosis on the CT head as well. So the CT scan shows a well-defined rounded hypodensity within the subarachnoid bleed within the interhemispheric fissure. This is referred to as a ghost sign and represents the ruptured aneurysm which is surrounded by the adjacent subarachnoid blood. There is associated hydrocephalus as well. A DSA was performed which demonstrated the aneurysm quite well and it was ultimately treated with coiling. So this is what is called as a ghost sign of an aneurysm within the subarachnoid blood distribution. In other cases, the, the aneurysms might not be as apparent as in this companion case. Here the subarachnoid hemorrhage itself is not very apparent, although you can identify some blood along the right perimedullary cistern extending into the foramen of Lushka going into the fourth ventricle. When the CT angiogram was done, no aneurysm was seen at the origin of pica, but distally within the cranial loop of the pica, there was a small dissecting aneurysm, which is well demonstrated on the DSA reconstruction. And this represented a pica aneurysm. So sometimes the aneurysm can be seen very well. Sometimes it's a bit hard to see. So in case you are not able to identify on CT angiogram, you need to perform a digital subtraction angiography. The cause of the subarachnoid bleed need not always be an aneurysm in the 
posterior fossa like in this case so again there is subarachnoid blood within the prepontine cistern going into either cerebellopontine angle cisterns and extending into the fourth ventricle as well ct angiogram shows a tangle of abnormal vessels in the region of left middle cerebellar peduncle and adjacent superior cerebellar hemisphere on performing a dsa this confirmed an avm which was seen in the same region which can occasionally bleed and give rise to intraparenchymal hematoma as well as subarachnoid blood sometimes the subarachnoid bleed is quite subtle to identify as in this case where the blood was seen in the right subicomedullary junction ct angiogram was performed which demonstrated no obvious aneurysm here so rightfully the next step of investigation would be to perform a dsa on the dsa again no obvious aneurysm was identified but the right pica was seen to be quite thready in its mid portion whenever you see a pica or a vertebral artery which looks a bit irregular and thready and associated subarachnoid bleed the thing to be suspected is a vertebral artery or pica aneurysm and you need to repeat the dsa the dsa was repeated and the same thready area of the pica now shows a fusiform large aneurysm this had to be treated urgently with the parent artery embolization using a liquid embolic agent so the takeaway point from this case is to repeat the dsa if you suspect a vertebral or pica dissection let's look at case number 4 this was a young chap uh, whose parents were both doctors and was on an adventure camp when he had a sudden onset headache there was some associated neck stiffness and bilateral sciatica as well the ct head was performed which was completely normal a typical teenager and refused to get a lumbar puncture done so instead an mr was performed because of the bilateral sciatica and it showed some blood within the caudal aspect of the thecal sac in the form of a fluid level an mr image of the brain was also done which demonstrated some abnormality in the cervical cord the cervical spine imaging demonstrated this to be an avm in the cord this was confirmed by doing a dsa which shows branches arising from bilateral vertebral arteries feeding the the avm with associated intranigral aneurysm which had possibly ruptured so keep a high index of suspicion in cases of subarachnoid bleed in the posterior fossa scan the cord for avm or anterior or posterior spinal artery pseudo aneurysm if you don't find anything in the intracranial circulation however the most common cause of the basal subarachnoid bleed is the perimesencephalic non aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage in these cases the ct head is positive showing subarachnoid blood but the ct angiogram is negative and the dsa is negative as well it is quite common it represents about 10 to 15% of the subarachnoid bleed distribution is classically described as lying within the prepontine interhemispheric and the ambient cistern but more often than not you can see some extension into the supracellular cistern medial part of the sylvian fissure and perimedullary cistern as well as well as within the ventricles it is always angiogenitive and the etiology is possible shearing damage to the veins the presentation is much milder clinical course is much better patient is usually feeling quite well within the next few days coming to the third pattern where the blood is distributed along the convexity let's look at few cases so this was a 70 year old male who was a priest by profession having multiple episodes of headache over the past few months of which two episodes had associated collapse and confusion as well there was some residual neck stiffness in these cases and this was the imaging the ct head study showed some subtle subarachnoid blood in the left frontal sulcus against a background of established small vessel ischemic changes the flare coronal images 
confirmed the blood within the left superior frontal sulcus. However, the most striking findings were seen on the susceptibility weighted imaging in the lower set of images. There are multiple areas of hemocytin staining in the brain in the left frontal region, left temporal lobe, as well as in the interhemispheric region. And there are at least three areas of microhemorrhages involving the right medial frontal, left frontal, and left temporal lobes. So this was associated with no obvious aneurysm seen on the CT angiogram. So this, the diagnosis in this case was cerebral amyloid angiopathy associated subarachnoid bleed. Subarachnoid bleed is quite common with cerebral amyloid angiopathy, so much so that it is now one of the diagnostic criteria. So if you look at modified Boston diagnostic criteria of CAA, it either needs multiple, that is more than or equal to two microhemorrhages, or one microhemorrhage and one sulcal bleed. So any patient who is more than or equal to 55 years of age and does not have other obvious cause of subarachnoid bleed can be labeled a CAA based on this, this criteria. The more typical picture of CAA is with multiple microhemorrhages along the subcortical U fibers. However, you need not have that many microhemorrhages to label a person as probable CAA. A companion case in this pattern is a case with known pulmonary tuberculosis who had respiratory failures and was put on the extracorporeal membrane oxygenator. When he was extubated, he complained of headache and an episode of seizure. So scan which was done showed subarachnoid bleed along the right frontal convexity. And when the MR was performed, it showed multiple microhemorrhages, not only in the subcortical U fibers, but also within the internal and external capsule and corpus callosum. So this feature is quite commonly seen with extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. And the additional location in these cases is the distribution along the deep white matters, the corpus callosum, internal and external capsules. Um, a lot of uh, different etiology has been proposed, like activation of clotting factors, generalized systemic inflammatory response, or change in the oxygen and CO2 levels within the body. A very similar sort of pattern is also seen with high altitude cerebral edema in mountaineers as well as with generalized sepsis. In a different age group, young or middle aged female who is one week postpartum, uh, there was a similar presentation with severe headache, vomiting, and neck stiffness. CT head study showed some blood along the interhemispheric fissure as well as the left frontal sulci. There was some parenchymal bleed as well within the subcortical areas, at least two small areas. If we look closely at the non-contrast CT head images, we can see some hyperdensity within the anterior part of the superior sagittal sinus. This was confirmed on the CT venogram, which showed the filling defect within the anterior superior sagittal sinus, confirming this to be cerebral venous sinus thrombosis. In cerebral venous sinus thrombosis, the bleeding is more common in the along the convexity or along the interhemispheric fissure. The venous hypertension itself can cause the subarachnoid hemorrhage or there can be an extension of the venous parenchymal hematoma. The clinical presentation can be very similar to aneurysmal SAH and the CT head st study can sometimes mimic the subarachnoid bleed. Let's look at case 8. This is again now an increasingly common cause of convexity subarachnoid bleed. Similar age group presenting with headache, episodes of vacant stare or possible seizure. Patient is on antidepressant medication and when a CT head was done, it showed some subtle subarachnoid blood within the left frontal sulcus. When a DSA was done, it showed these multiple areas of narrowing involving bilateral posterior cerebral arteries, middle cerebral arteries, and anterior cerebral arteries, like a string of sausage appearance. This sort of appearance on a digital subtraction angiogram is strongly suggestive of two main 
diseases, reversible cerebral vasoconstriction syndrome, and vasculitis. The only way to be sure that this is reversible cerebral vasoconstriction syndrome is to see the reversal. So when a repeat DSA was performed after a few months, all these changes appear much less prominent and almost negligible. So this was a typical case of a reversible cerebral vasoconstriction syndrome. There is a diagnostic criteria proposed by Anne Ducross and it involves acute severe headache with or without focal deficit and seizures, uniphasic course, the typical segmental vasoconstriction on any of these modalities, DSA, MR angio or CT angiogram. You still need to rule out an intracranial aneurysm. The normal or near normal CSF is important because it helps in differentiating it from an acute phase of vasculitis where usually you will have some inflammatory markers on the CSF. But the definite confirming factor is the complete or substantial normalization of arteries in about 12 weeks time. There are multiple precipitants of reversible cerebral vasoconstriction syndrome and every month something new is usually found which leads to reversible cerebral vasoconstriction syndrome. A companion case, a 67 year old was found with episode of severe headache about 10 days back, having neck pain since then and recently has episode of weakness in the right arm. Now the occupation of this patient is quite important because farmers anywhere in the world are quite sturdy people. They won't come to the hospital unless they are really unwell. So there was some bleeding only along one of the frontal convexity sulcus. There was no blood within the supracellar cistern. However, if you look at the region next to the anterior clinoid process, there was a suspicion of an aneurysm and a CT angiogram was performed accordingly, which confirmed a left PCOM aneurysm. So this was actually a delayed presentation of a acute aneurysmal subarachnoid bleed. So in cases of delayed presentation, distribution of blood is not very reliable and you still need to rule out an aneurysm. Coming to the last bit of our talk is the pseudo subarachnoid hemorrhage. Pseudo subarachnoid hemorrhage means an increased attenuation along the subarachnoid spaces mimicking hemorrhage on CT. So there is no subarachnoid blood as such, but the hyperdensity might be because of diffuse anoxic damage or because of a meningeal inflammatory process. If you look on this CT head study, you will see that there is diffuse cerebral edema, there is hyperdensity along the frontal lobes medially as well as along the temporal lobes and because of the hyperdensity of the adjacent brain, the venous blood within the subarachnoid space apparently looks more hyperdense and mimics a subarachnoid hemorrhage. So this is diffuse cerebral edema giving rise to a pseudo subarachnoid appearance. Similar appearance can be seen with meningitis as is seen in this case where there is extensive hyperdensity along the meninges of the posterior fossa but more along the surface of the cerebellum. There is some hyperdensity along the posterior part of left sylvian fissure as well. Meningitis mimicking subarachnoid bleed is especially common in cases of tuberculous meningitis although the presentation there will be slightly different from that of acute subarachnoid bleed. Whenever there is a doubt you can always rely on clinical history and MR imaging to differentiate between true and pseudo subarachnoid blood. So we looked at detection of subarachnoid hemorrhage. In detection Please concentrate on review areas before saying that the CT is negative for subarachnoid bleed to avoid a diagnosis of missed subarachnoid. There is definitely a role for lumbar puncture in cases of delayed presentation. Have a low threshold for CT angiogram if the distribution of blood is atypical. If dissecting aneurysm of vertebral or pica is suspected in cases of posterior fossa subarachnoid bleed, there is a role for repeat. CT angiogram or DSA. There are patterns 
for subarachnoid bleed and accordingly the differential diagnosis closely relates to it. However, if there is a delayed presentation, patterns are not always reliable. In cases of pseudo subarachnoid bleed, always have associated clinical correlation. And if there is still a doubt, MR imaging is very helpful. Thank you.